Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. How is everyone? Hope everyone is good and thank you for joining us. Good morning and Salam Malaysia Madani to and welcome to Research Revolution webinar series. And this series will focus on microelectronics and semi um, microelectronics and nanotechnology. My name is Lawrence and I'm from Imos Berhad. I'm honored to be your master of ceremony for today's event. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, informative session, get ready for enriching experience. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items to ensure a smooth and enjoyable webinar for everyone. If you have any questions or comment, please utilize the chat feature and our team will be there to assist you. We have an incredible lineup of distinguished speakers who are experts in their respective fields. They will share their knowledge, experiences, and best practices, which we hope will inspire and empower you. In addition to speaker session, we have a located time for question and answer session. Your participation is highly encouraged, so please feel free to ask questions in the chat. We will try our best to address as many questions as possible. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Your presence here signifies your commitment to personal and professional growth, and we commend you for that. Without further ado, let's dive right into our first session. Our speaker will be shedding light on unleashing the potential in jet printing as a key element in research of flexible hybrid electronics. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Said. Mohammad Hafiz, Mimos Perhat. Over to you, sir. Dr. Said, don't forget to unmute. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you, Lawrence. Let me share my slide presentation first. Okay, can you all see the, the slide? Yes, sir. Okay, so thank you uh, for the introduction, Lawrence. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to the academia, industry, and also researcher. So first of all, I would like to welcome you all to MIMOS webinar for today. And I am Dr. Said. I will be presenting on the unleashing the potential in jet printing as a key element in the research of flexible hybrid electronics. So in this webinar, I will be going to give an insight on what is flexible hybrid electronics and how inject printing technology can bring the research into a field like wearables technology, healthcare, and also wireless sensors. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, I'll be able to spark some uh, interest or some ideas for the audience to move into this area and pursue the road to commercialize of your current research product. So this is uh, uh, the snapshot of my presentation today. I have divided it into uh, several subtopics. So the first one will be on the introduction to the flexible hybrid electronics. Second one will be on the role of inject printing in this flexible hybrid electronics research. And then I will follow with the case study where the inject printing will be utilized in fabricating uh, several types of devices. And also finally on the challenge and also future prospect uh, for the uh, current research. So moving on to the first subtopic will be on the introduction to the flexible hybrid electronics. So as an introduction, we need to be able to distinguish between what is PCB, stand for printed circuit board, FCB, stand for flexible circuit board, FHE, also stand for the flexible hybrid electronics. So based on the picture given, uh, the PCB printed circuit board is what we normally see in the market at the moment. And then moving to the FCB, which are flexible circuit boards, so they are normally uh, the electronic circuits uh, come from the DSLR camera, for example. They are a semi-flexible, 
but the process to fabricate it are different compared to the flexible hybrid electronics where we can remove some part of the processes, for example, on the etching and also on the plating of the copper trace to make a conductive element, even though it is still a flexible one, but the process to fabricate the flexible circuit board are totally different in comparing to the flexible hybrid electronics. And then uh, we move to the introduction to the uh, devices itself. So based on the graph here, uh, we can see the comparison between the functionality and also the increase on the flexibility of the device. So based on these three type of the electronic device uh, from the PCB, which we already have, and then the technology are very matured uh, nowadays, where we position the flexible hardware electronic is, is in the middle, where it is still new, and then the technology needs uh, a little bit push uh, to commercialize it. So we can uh, know that the device has a very new form factor because nowadays we are moving into uh, wearables devices. All our electronic devices, uh, we wear this every day. It needs to be uh, very lightweight and also it needs to sustain uh, a different uh, form of flexibility so that we can use it without uh, any in, give some any intention uh, to feel the weight or to feel whether we we wearing the device uh, actually at the moment. So in comparing uh, these three type of devices, PCB, FCB, and also FSE, is on the interconnects. How do you fabricate it? The first one for the PCB and also FCB is the fabrication involved for the etching copper and also a plating of the copper plate to make a conductive trace. While for the flexible habit electronics, we do some printing and then we eliminate the processes needed to fabricate the traces. For example, we might have a copper base in that we can print. Some uh, they have silver base, some they have graphene composite that have uh, certain conductivity so that they can uh, fabricate the uh, flexible hybrid electronics much more faster. And then moving on to the passive component uh, of fabricating for the PCB of the, for example, resistor or active material for the sensor, we can also directly print using an active material, for example, P.PSS straight away on top of it. In comparing to the PCB and also FCB, it requires different uh, processes to embed a new material on top of it. So the fabrication of the process takes much more longer in comparing to the flexible hybrid electronics. And then here, we move into the comparison between a conventional electronic and also a printed electronic. So as you can see on the left-hand side, we have some uh, comparison between the material, the manufacturing techniques, the product feature, and also the process. So in summary to this comparison, we can see that it takes a much more simpler process to fabricate a flexible uh, printed electronic in comparing to the conventional electronics. And then based on the material to, uh, uh, for it to be fabricated, it is normally for the conventional electronic to be deposited or to be fabricated on a high temperature silicon substrate, uh, ceramics, PCB, and also a, a glass, for example. And then the manufacturing technique is uh, normally is very expensive and that is involved with the photolithography, you need uh, masking uh, also, and then uh, micro machining, for example. So it's involved a uh, highly cost equipment to fabricate it. Even though the process has been uh, very matured and then the cost has been reduced uh, significantly, but uh, we have a new competitor with the printed electronics where uh, we just need a cost to as an early investment to purchase a certain equipment so that we can cater to the much more simpler processes. So these printed electronics normally falls 
under the additive manufacturing process, which give uh, several kind of advantages such as shorten production time because of the reduction in the process step. It's also reduce uh, material waste since we can use uh, a very minute amount of material and then it's not as subtractive because for subtractive, we have a bulk or chunk of material and then we need to subtract it or we need to sculpture it or we need to remove most of the parts so that parts will be become a waste. And then it's also easy to customize if we are moved into a printed electronic. So based on the customization, so we can do a lot of customization, uh, much more simpler and also we can bring forward a new product into the market much more faster. Moving on, it's also cheaper to make a prototype because uh, a lot of conventional electronics, they use a uh, much more bigger stencil and then to make a stencil is, is much more expensive. It also reduce uh, labor cost because of the process is taken much more uh, simpler compared to the conventional electronics. So these are some technology approach comparison. So we have uh, several attributes that I want to discuss in terms of the first one, in terms of the costing between conventional electronics and also flexible hybrid electronics. So in terms of costing, it is about uh, the same compared from the both technique. But in terms of functionality, since the conventional electronic is very matured, so it can also already produce a complex multi-layer circuits board which can literally produce with very high yield. At the moment, uh, flexible hybrid electronic is at the uh, going to the matured stage of uh, commercialization. And we can see nowadays uh, several devices has been employed this type of electronics in their product. So the traction has been uh, seen now. So in terms of ease of development, sustainability, and also variation in the form factor, so conventional electronic falls slightly behind. So with this new form factor, flexible hybrid electronic give us a new type of uh, devices uh, so that we can use it. For example, nowadays we are more into a wearables electronics. So, we have also discussed about the conventional electronics. We also know about the flexible habit electronics, but what we haven't heard is fully printed electronics. So there is some limitation when we want to move from the conventional electronics to a fully printed electronic. So the limitation are is for fully printed electronics, even though it has a good conformability, a printability, lightweight but it lacks a lot in terms of limited memory of processing power because nowadays the ic chips are also based on the silicon processes which are not fully flexible so this technology is very new so that's why uh, for a product to be commercialized we limit the step up to the stage of flexible hybrid electronics so the, for the fully printed electronic, it is still considered a new R&D stage. So it still needs uh, several years uh, before it can be commercialized. So there are some advantage and also disadvantages for the flexible hybrid electronics. In terms of the advantages, it can also reduce the loss of material. It also has an expensive manufacturing processes and also equipment costs. In terms of capability to mass manufacture it, it can de be done using the sheet to sheet or roll to roll processes. The application for the devices is also diverse. So application for the various flexible substrate, it can be applied or it can be printed on top of new type of substrate. For example, plastic, pulse, and also papers. So this then also reduce the emission of toxic substances, and also it is also a environmental friendly process in comparing to the conventional processes. So, but there are some limitation uh, to the flexible hybrid electronic. So since uh, on the right hand side image, we can see that this is not typical 
uh, material or typical element that we put in on top of our circuit uh, board. So most of the product we can print it, but some of the devices, for example, uh, memories or communication interface, that one still cannot be uh, fully printed. So for example, what we can print now is, for example, the display, uh, polymer solar cell, antenna, thin firm battery, that is some part that we can uh, straight away use inject printing or flexible printed electronic processes to fabricate the device. So moving on, on the application of flexible hybrid electronics. So in short, it is FHE. So we can see there are already some product that has been commercialized in terms of automotive and also electric vehicle because now electric vehicle, they have uh, a lot of sensors and also they don't want uh, a toggle anymore. So all need to be in a touch screen. So the form factor also need to be uh, much more thinner. So that's why all the circuit, all the traces, all the wires need to be replaced uh, by the uh, hybrid electronic. And then some more in recent uh, Winter Olympic in 2018. So USA company, uh, they have been from the Rough Rodden uh, textile. So they have used a jacket, heated jacket. They printed uh, a heater, printed heater at the back of the jacket and front of the jacket itself to give comfort uh, to their athlete when compete in the 2018 Winter Olympic uh, at South Korea. And then in terms of healthcare application, we can do, uh, we can uh, place the sensor, for example, to do a real-time monitoring uh, uh, to the babies, for example, because the comfort are very important. So if the comfortability for the sensor to be placed on top of the patient uh, is bulky and it restricts some movement, so uh, it falls uh, behind. So that's why when we bring a flexible hybrid electronics into the market, we can move it and then we can give uh, some more benefit to the patient itself. And then in terms of sensors, of course, we can also print uh, different types of sensors such as physical, electrochemical, and also biochemical sensors. So in terms of market trends and opportunity, here we can see that from the uh, market uh, segment that I uh, snapshot it from Frost and Sullivan 2019. It says that the printed sensor will disrupt the healthcare, consumer electronics, and also automotive industries. So this one will projected uh, to have a 3.5 billion in 2029 in terms of flexible and also printed sensor. But uh, here, the backbone for all this one come from the conductive ink itself, and also the active material itself. So to make it happen, so the ink or the conductive material is very important, and also it comes later on with the device. So we're moving on to the second uh, subtopic, which are the role of inject printing in the flexible hybrid electronic research. So. Looking at the left-hand side graph, these are all techniques that can be used to fabricate a flexible hybrid devices. We have heard about the screen printing, flexographic, gravure printing. So that technology is already established. And then inject printing is a new one that are just past the R&D processes. And then the industry has been catching up with using, with employing this kind of technique to fabricate their electronic devices. So when we are talking about commercialization, the maturity of the machinery, of the supply for the equipment, as well as the cost are the main things that we consider. So the cost of changing, for example, uh, the cost of changing the laser etcher gravity cylinder uh, for the analog printing, and also the screen printing stencil is very expensive. And then if, we want to do iteration with new product development, so it takes much more longer time. So let's say if we want to order a new design for the stencil printing, it normally takes about one week 
processing time before we can have a new design. So the iteration takes one design per week. But let's say if we can digitally use the printing tool instead of analog printing tool. So for the digital printing tool, we can easily change the design into our PC and then straight away do a, a larger iteration in one week time, for example. So we can do maybe up to 20 different design based on one week only in comparing to the analog printing process. So in comparing to the different kind of uh, printed method, for example, we have AFM printed method, the uh, little ultra precise deposition, aerosol jet, and also laser induced uh, transfer, forward transfer. So this technology are still considered as an early stage. So it is too early uh, for this kind of technique to commercialize it and then to fabricate it uh, for the device, the cost will be very high. So it is good uh, for the R&D stage to be able to use this kind of uh, equipment to fabricate the device. But the most one uh, that uh, emerging now is on the inject printing. So when we are looking uh, at the printing resolution for the inject printer, so it can rival more on the uh, flexography and also screen printing. So, but in terms of costing, the inject printing is much more cost wisely compared to the Graview because you need to use a, a, a laser to etch some uh, design on top of the graview cylinder. So the cost is much more expensive. So moving on to the inject printer equipment. So as we all know, and also most of us have our personal inject printer. So every day we use the inject printer to print uh, documents. You can do a uh, basic printing and also the print speed is maybe about uh, 100 millimeter per second. So it's, it's quite fast for us to print a document nowadays, but we have now with the R&D industrial inject printer for the flexible hydrogen electronics, we add additional features. So the additional features can be a printing setting adjustment. We can tune the substrate temperature. We can tune the temperature of the ink itself. We can also tune the jetting parameter and then we can tune the layer of layer printing. The printing speed also much more faster compared to the uh, personal inject printer. And then for the pilot manufacturing, it is much more faster compared to the rest. And then the printing speed is up to 1000 millimeter per second. So at the bottom part, we can see different kind of print head. So normally we are encountered with the uh, office print head, which are normally we change it maybe six months, uh, once uh, for the six months, depending on how much we do the printing. But for the industrial inject printer, we have much more nozzle compared to the office printer. That's why the printing speed is much more faster. And then the output will be much more bigger. So the development process for the inject printing uh, involved with the preparation of the nanomaterial development and also pilot production of the raw material itself. And then moving on, it has a nano formulated development. We need to formulate the uh, ink itself so that we can bring it into an inject printer. And then, and then we will do for the printing using inject printer. Finally, we make a device based on that and then we do a test validation. So basically, all these facilities are available in our lab, which is called Flexible Electronics Lab. So we are also providing a full solution beginning from the formulated inks up to the printing and also as well as testing. So moving on to the inject printer, which are the heart of the printhead itself. So the ink, we need to put it into a inject uh, print head, and then we need to eject it one by one into the substrate. So it beats, and then with a certain rhyme called waveform. This is the type of waveform, and then to eject a functional in on top of the target substrate. And then we can have a precise control of the ink ejected from one picoliter 
up to 80 picoliter. So one picoliter is very minute amount. So we doesn't consume a lot of ink by using inject printing technique. So in this slide, so to do a parameter optimization, normally we control the printing from the top one and optimize it to the bottom one. So for the top one, if the printing parameter is not optimized, we can only see a blur image. But when we do some optimization into the printing itself, in terms of cartridge height, jetting frequency, the type of print head, and also some parameter setting that we can do, it's become better and better, and then we can clearly see the square images much more clearer compared to the top one, which are the parameter are not optimized. <coughs> so in this image, the square box here is about 300 uh, micrometer uh, dimension, and then the gap itself also in 300 micrometer dimension. So we always do a statistical analysis to see how good is the printing that we can do. In terms of characterization of inject printed pattern, so move to the number one, we will do for the repetitive design, like a previous slide I shown, we printed about a thousands of boxes, square boxes, and then we analyze it uh, uh, randomly. So what are the dimension and then what are the variation between one design to another design? So based on this calculation, we capture the size of the dot that we can print and also the thickness of the dot that we can print itself. So some products, uh, they required, uh, for example, an electrode gap or electrode distance. So moving to the picture number two, we can control by using inject printer the distance of the electrode, for example, interdigitated electrode, or if you want to fabricate a uh, uh, source drain gate voltage, for example, devices. So that one required a certain gap between their electrodes. So we are comfortable to change the electrode gap from 245 down to 30 micron. But from the inject, uh, from the perspective of screen printing, to achieve this kind of resolution is quite hard when it is down in the segment of 100 micrometer down to 30 micrometer. Moving on to the third image for the PCB circuit design, we can already print the PCB design. This one, we print it on top of the PET and also uh, uh, paper substrate, electronic paper substrate. So we can see that the small uh, traces of the conductive ink here, uh, it does not uh, short circuit between each other. So we can get a good PCB circuit design uh, based on the inject printing patterns that we have done. So moving to the reliability testing of the inject printer electrode. Since we are using it uh, for the <coughs> flexible electronics, we need to know whether it is still robust or not. So the robustity, we test it by bending it up to 20,000 times. So normally for the 10,000 of time of bending, <coughs> we have about uh, three years of life cycle. So that's why how we trace the amount of uh, the, the shelf life of the product itself. So based on this one, <clears throat> we can test that it is uh, able to withstand up to 10,000 cycles. So <clears throat> this one, we have a dynamic mechanical analyzer, which we can control the bending uh, up to uh, more than 1 million times. So at the moment, we're testing the product up to 20,000 cycles. So to complete the printed circuit, we need to make it into a flexible habit electronics. So uh, to make it into a flexible habit electronic, we must put the SMD component and then embed it on top of the uh, circuit design. So what we have now, we cannot use a reflow process because the reflow process consider at a high temperature. And then it will destroy the substrate that we use, which are normally plastic, which can not uh, withstand a high temperature. So with the photonic soldering process, <clears throat> it gives 
a pass of the uh, light so that it can heat up uh, the uh, solder paste at a very short moment without destroying the substrate itself. So the soldering process can be done easily at even though at a very uh, temperature sensitive subject such as PET. So these are some uh, comparison between uh, different kind of soldering process that we can do. So based on this comparison, <coughs> we can see that the photonic soldering able to uh, cater to the needs for the soldering of the SMD component. And then the process is much more faster compared to the reflow process, which takes about five seconds to solder, completely solder the SMD component on top of it. But for the CAPEX, we need uh, a new equipment uh, to solder it to be able to cater to the new process. <clears throat> but in our lab, we have a new equipment that can perform this kind of uh, soldering. So <clears throat> we move to the case study where the inject printing has been utilized in the fabrication of the flexible hybrid devices. <coughs> so there are some uh, example for the development of dielectric coating and also solar cell. For example, there are some company that are already commercialized uh, this technique. They use uh, an inject printing to print a solder mass on top of it. So they use this kind of technique because it is more environmental friendly. And also, <coughs> the costs are, are much more lower. They can also give a material saving up to 80% uh, when they are using inject printing technique in comparing to their previous technique. And then for the solar cell, they can also do a verification for the prop skype material because some of the prop skype, they can make it into an in type and then they can straight away print it. And then based on this one, uh, from a certain uh, industry and also some research, they say that they have performed uh, a inject printing of the prop skype and then the printed device can achieve more than 18% of efficiency. For the upscaling, it takes much more lower cost and also the design, they have a lot of freedom uh, for the design itself. Here are some examples uh, of the development that we have performed uh, with our collaborator from University of Malaya at the MRC. So they developed a gate cycle head care sensor for the patient with a spinal injury which are going, uh, which are undergo uh, uh, physiotherapy uh, recovery uh, stages. So for them, uh, the doctors need to uh, evaluate what are the stages they are, their patient are, mm. and then they need to know whether they are, they are, they, are, uh, they need to acquire the data for the gate cycle. The gate cycle uh, actually is to monitor the movement of a potential ankle that varies between 25 degree up to the 65 degree. <clears throat> so based on the uh, electrode that uh, we collaborate together to design it, the person are able to notice and also capture a signal that can be tested with different various degree of bending angle and that is reflect back to the gate cycle which involved with different kind with different degree of gate cycle so this is an uh, example for the head care sen uh, sensor and then moving on to the development of humidity sample here we print uh, two type of e the first one will be the conductive traces which are from a silver base and also a graphene base so for this one, the active material will be on the P dot PSS, which are sensitive to the humidity itself. So we have done study on how many layers we can print the P dot PSS, and then what are the sensitivity, the best sensitivity that we get. So two papers has been published uh, regarding this technique and then this material as a flexible hybrid electronic for the humidity sensor application. So the next one will be on the development of the chipless RFID 
humidity sensor. At the beginning of the stage of this project, we have done uh, the printed for the RFID circuit. And then we have also tested by embedded a chip, RFID chip on top of it. And then with this technology, we combine with the previous slide that have uh, active material to sense a humidity sensor. We combine both technology for the wireless and also active material for the humidity sensor, combine it into a, a one chipless RFID humidity sensor, <coughs> which the data can be transmitted wirelessly. And also, it is also react with the changes of the humidity. <coughs> so the final one <coughs> will be on the development of fully inject printed NFC temperature sensor. This one we have done with the Dr. Asrol, uh, the, the, the next speaker, which are from USM. So we have a version one, which we printed <coughs> different kind of ink. The first one will be silver ink, and also the second one is the graphene ink. So we print a uh, different turn or different number of NFC coil, and then uh, we embedded it with the uh, PCB uh, circuit design. <coughs> Based on this one, we can confirm that the NFC uh, design that we inject printed by using both of our ink, it can work well with the NFC by transmitting the data to the smartphone. <coughs> that one considered as a version one. So we move to the version number two, which which are replacing the M, the NFC and also the PCB one to be fully printed on top of the one substrate. So the final device can be as small as our credit card, and then the thickness of the sensor itself can be uh, as thin as our credit card as well. So we are at the process of soldering the SMD component using the photonic soldering equipment that I shown previously so that we can complete the circuit and then eventually uh, moving toward towards the next stage. So with this, here are the list of our collaborators uh, by, by contract research, for example, that works on the flexible hybrid devices. Uh, most of it I cannot disclose due to the uh, NDA uh, with the industry, but we are seeing attraction from the industry based on this segment. Not to forget that we also have used this collaborate with us bringing uh, brilliant ideas for this kind of devices. And then many areas from the printed electrodes, transistor, as well as wireless sensor devices. So <clears throat> these are some uh, product trademarks. We have different kind of inks, and then the devices, we call it as a MyFlexSense. And then uh, we have a uh, silver base, graphene base, and then whether the curing need a uh, very low temperature or the curing needs to use uh, as a UV curing, for example. So we have different kind of inks that can cater different kind of uh, end devices that you want to, to produce. So two of our product here uh, has been certified by the uh, graphene verified. So, and then uh, some more in the pipeline uh, to certify it so that we can confirm that the ink itself has contained a nanomaterial inside it. So <clears throat> for the final one is on the challenge and also future prospect. So we have still have a, a few challenges and also the challenge can be on the equipment capability in terms of multi-material. So because we need to print different kind of material uh, 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 conductive ink to make a uh, conductive traces and active material to send something. So these two type of ink need to be printed together. And then sometimes we need this kind of hybrid printing, which is not limited to the inject printing itself. It's need to involve different kind of form factor, for example, aerosol jet, uh, ultrasonic printing. So <coughs> this type of processes or hybrid printing can cater to a wider version of the wearable devices or electronic devices that we have an idea on. So we have a wider version to work on with the uh, hybrid printing as well. So the second challenge will be on the sustainable manufacturing. So sustainable manufacturing is a very crucial issue now. So since 
uh, most of us maybe print it into a plastic substrate. So, and then uh, most of the sensors use it one time only. So to recycle it, it's also need a new segment of research to do a recycle for the one time use sensor, for example. So this is what we need to, to think. And then this is what uh, the, the possible hybrid electronic comes in as a challenge. And then finally, on the investment and also upscaling, whether we want to go from the sheet to sheet or roll to roll. So from sheet to sheet is the design might be limited to the A4 size or A3 sizes. For roll to roll, it be a continuous web of production. <clears throat> but if we are focusing more on the customization of the design, so sheet to sheet is a way to go. For roll to roll, if you have been passed through uh, the process of R&D and then you ju just want to replicate the processes, the processes uh, are, are done in a fixed manner. So roll to roll is a way moving forward. So these are the things as a, uh, I put as a challenge and also future prospect in this kind of work. So as a summary, <clears throat> the printed electronic may substitute the existing process, including etching, uh, photolithography, metallizing, and also plating. The inject printing uh, can offer a significant potential uh, to bring the research from uh, to the flexible hybrid electrodes, enabling uh, a precise and also scalable manufacturing processes. So in our lab, we have a coming uh, pilot printer so that we, we, uh, we can use to give a minimal quantity order uh, for you guys to, to be tested and then to confident with the process that uh, we can do as a test bed. And then uh, for the, we also gain insight how to develop the application and also the case study that presented, maybe you can spark some more ideas and then we can collaborate more on this part. And then we also encourage uh, collaboration between the academia and also industry because the importance of sharing knowledge and also fostering a research partnership to future to unlock a more potential uh, for the flexible hybrid device. So this is uh, the acknowledgement for my team. Special thanks to the expert and also the lab members. And then uh, thank you. So I open uh, for any uh, question from the floor. Dr. Said, since there is uh, no questions on the chat, maybe it will come right at the end. Okay, okay? sure. Okay. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, be, uh, thank you, Dr. Said. Uh, by, by the way, I did, um, I would like to say a little bit about Dr. Said. He is, of course, um, the winner of the uh, Malaysian Commercialization Year 2018 main award for the category of research entrepreneur award receiving a check of 130,000. Uh, currently he's attached to advanced material and semiconductor technology department at me Berhad, which is actively involved in R&D related to automated solutions, phase chemical synthesis of graphene related nanomaterials and pilot scale fabrication process for flexible electronic device using addictive manufacturing. Yeah, that was a little bit about Dr. Said. You can get his full bio on the event uh, website. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout the webinar, we encourage you to actively engage in the discussion by sharing your thoughts, insights, and questions in the chat. Remember, uh, living, uh, learning is a collaborative process, and your contributions are valuable to the collective knowledge of our community. Our next speaker is Dr. Asul Nizam bin Abdul Manaf, Associate Professor, Director, Collaborative Microelectronics Design Excellence Center, University Science Malaysia. His research interest has been in the areas of analog integrated circuit, lab on printed circuit board, MEMS technology and printed stretchable electronic sensing system. He received IETE JS Bose Memorial Award in 2017 for the best engineering oriented paper. He's also a senior member of IEEE and vice chair for IEEE Sensor and Nanotechnology Council of Malaysia Joint Chair. Dr. Azul Nizam, can you switch on your mic and your 
camera, please. Yes, yep. Okay, there you go. So, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hand you over to Prof. Azrul. Prof. Azrul, over to you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Lauren, for kindly uh, introductions. So let I share the screen first. First, uh, everyone can see my screen and can hear my voice. Yes, doc. Uh, yes, okay, we good. can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, first I would like thanks to uh, Lauren for a kindly introductions, and also thanks to uh, Mimos and for uh, inviting me to share the and the one of the our research activities in uh, my uh, centers. So uh, today I would like to uh, give overview about our current uh, research activity that related to a printed circuit board. So how the talk today is more to the lab, how we, the our development, the best on a printed circuit board, how we develop the biosensors and also the physical uh, sensors. So from uh, the from a first uh, speaker and then Dr. Sai, he already mentions what the technology that that we have now in terms of the the technology for uh, printing that means to how how uh, how we can print the sensors the circuit but uh, we still have the limitations on certain thing in terms of the properties towards to the biosensors applications okay so that the my outline of my uh, presentations, so I will give a quick overview about my centers and then I will uh, go through a few uh, project that we done uh, we, uh, in uh, development, uh, biosensors, how we using the printed circuit board technique from the rigid PCB, they mean from the rigid FR4, how we migrate to the flexible and the sensible subset and the last I, I will uh, list out the challenges and and summarize my talk. Okay, so uh, actually uh, uh, our centers uh, named as a collaborative microelectronic design centers. So we one of the center of excellence under Senate USM. And uh, this year we, we also appointed by NCIA as a COE providers. Uh, mainly, uh, we have a uh, close uh, collaborations with the fabulous chip designs uh, like Op Opstar SkyChip, and also with uh, Mimos, and also a few uh, foundry like the Siltera and also the global uh, foundries. So, our location at Bukit Jambu, and uh, just uh, 15 minutes from uh, Penang Airport. So and then we we also have the international linkages with a partnership with the international uh, 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 academia. That's like from the Japan, Toyota University of Technology Japan, and also from the China, the Xiamen University of Technologies, and also from the Taiwan NCTU. Okay, so what the role of our centers here? Actually, we 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 uh, provide a set facilities to all the 31 universities uh, specific on the sharing the uh, the chip design uh, software. So how uh, by having the ecosystem, how we make it all the academia or the S SME, they be able to design the chip. And then that we go through a chip a tap uh, Currently we are working with the Siltera and also a Mimos and that and then that have a uh, to to uh, mean not only do the design but be able to materialize their uh, silicon. 
So that what we offer to all the universities. So we be the one stop centers to the academia, I mean to access our server and then do do uh, do the design, and then how we link up the design with the foundry with a silk terra, and then we do the packaging and uh, testing. So okay, let what 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 we are focused in my uh, centers. Actually, we have uh, the 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 main uh, the the big two groups. So how we have a group that on the circuit design mainly uh, focus on the silicon based chip design. How we are focused on the analog part. I mean we have the transceiver group and also the CMOS sensing interface group. So then by having that uh, circuitry, how we be able to integrate with the uh, sensors. So for uh, uh, for the sensor development, actually we are focused on two technologies. Of course, the one of technology we using the silicon process, MEMS or the NEM process, but right now we, we, we also are focused on the uh, the printable electronic. So how uh, how we work with our partners that come out a new uh, good the ink, the conductive ink or the good conductive stressable ink. So how uh, how we can utilize the ink towards to do the biosensors development like let we call as the lab on printed circuit board. How we be able to uh, design or to develop the biosensors component on a printed circuit board, such as the uh, the DNA sensors, and then how we do the integrations with the microfluidic. That means that be able to minimize the 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 volume of the sample, and then uh, we also uh, do on the back end part. So how we work with uh, partners towards to. Uh, how to work to the advanced uh, uh, packaging because we have the chip, we, we have the sensors, but the next issue is the uh, the, li the limitations of the the packaging specific, like we have the microfluidic on chip, so that but we don't have the standard uh, pack, uh, packaging to encapsulate uh, the microfluidy and then do the integration with the our three out circuit so that we we also are working on some uh, technologies how to have the full packaging I mean the set the circuit and also the microfluidic uh, recently in terms of the collaborations actually uh, for the chip design we we work with the Siltera for uh, for the Siltera process. We open to the everyone 31 consortium to to be able to send the chip through MPW program, the monthly program where first, but for the ST micro and the uh, global foundry and the TSMC. So that's uh, solid for our internal uh, CDAC research. Um, Collaborations. We want to be uh, the the education fabulous integrated research center, but mainly for the education and the resource development. So that what the chip that we done in the future, the chip the uh, the 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 transceiver chip through ST micro and the Siltera and also to the SFAB and also some uh, research on the true silicon via packaging through our master students towards to go to the high end uh, um, packaging and then how uh, how we work how our track record uh, working on the development uh, what we call the uh, the lab on printed circuit board but the PCB we try to veritize of the the type of the PCB from the rigid PCB on the stressable on the PET on the PBA so for the for the today talk, I just uh, focus on our development, uh, the lab on printed circuit board, how we, uh, how we apply on the rigid PCB, and then how we migrate on the stressable or and a flexible uh, 
PCB towards to the sensor applications. So that what we are going to talk today, how our development, how we are using the platform on the conventional printed circuit board, how we, we develop the electrochemical based sensing devices. So one, uh, I want we talk about the biosensors technologies, right? So uh, because uh, the we want uh, that we we talk about the micro task, the micro total analysis system. So what we want I mean all the process, I mean all the sample and all the analytical can be done on one subset. So that what we call the lab on printed circuit board. All uh, we have a term called lab on chip, right? So the the lab on chip, how we how the technology be able to create the functions of the pipette, the functions of mixers, the functions of the detection on one subset. They like the lab on chip, and then we have a term also lab on CMOS the lab on papers, right? So, but uh, uh, due to the limitation on the certain disadvantages, so if we focus on the lab on chip like the uh, silicon, the issue in terms of the operating temperatures and the issue are the challenges to do the integration with the other components such as like heaters and then any the, the micro pump and then that how uh, uh, difficulties because they involve on the silicon micro machining uh, process. So on to that, so that's why how we, uh, uh, so our group, how the possibilities, uh, we replace the silicon as a subset and we replace to the printed circuit board. So on the printed circuit board, what we aim, so we, we have the input, uh, we have the inlet that need to flow in the samples and then they they we go through uh, that uh, channel so that can be as a mixing so for example like we have the uh, the, the 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 sample a and then the catalyzed sample b and then we flow and then with that uh, structures using the understanding on the Reynolds numbers so that can do the develop the turbulent flow so that can be as a mixing and then go to the uh, area and then do the detection and then can be able to uh, on one chip so be able from uh, do the diagnosis so what the advantages if so by having that technologies actually we can minimize the volume by do the integrations with the microfluidic and then the, the, the second, because all the system do on the chip, so the size become a small, so that can create a faster, the fast detections, right? So as, as a criteria do the development of the biosensor, actually we, we need to follow the S tool, mean the affordable, so of course, what we develop can be the affordable. Mean uh, can be easier to risk even though for example like the low income or like the B40s, and they must have the sensitivities, must have the specificity that must be must uh, the equipment free. So I mean that can be do the on-site uh, uh, testing or the on-site uh, checking. Of course the the, the rapid response time and deliverable. So with that criteria, so how we apply the concept uh, electrochemical reactions so that we can do the simplify the detection method using the EC. We no need the light source, right? So we just need the, the, the uh, sensitive good electrode design and the uh, flexibilities and then by the integrate with a microfluidic that be able to minimize the sample and then can enhance the performance of the detection 
and then by using the technique of the PCB, we hope that can be a best a process so that can uh, re reduce the low cost of the uh, the the cost of the fabrication. So, uh, so when we talk about the electrochemical uh, sensors, jelly, uh, this is based on the the three working electrode. So how how I will do it. so the one uh, one we do the sensors actually we can have divided to the three uh, platform the first we need the transducers platform so right now what our transducers actually we based on the electrochemical uh, sensing principle so when we have the electrochemical so how uh, how to cast the analyte the sample so we we need the receptors so uh, so when we have the receptors so that that we need the target the analyte so the uh, receptor can be uh, like the antibody or can be as a dna can be the protein so that and then must the receptor must must a uh, selective to the target or to the type of the uh, di di type of the dinosaur that we, we we want to do the detection. So how our lab, so we migrate uh, from the conventional as a bulky system, so the three working electrode, and then we migrate on the chip-based uh, electrochemical uh, sensors. Now how we utilize the technologies that we call the lab on printed circuit board. So that how the the overview of our revolutions or the, the evolutions of our EC electrode. The first, uh, just uh, I did my PhD, but I did on the lab on chip, we using on the uh, silicon, the MEMS and NEM approach, I do the microprocessing. So when we return back, so let's say, but we have the limitations of the access for the high end uh, semiconductors fabrications. So that we, so that how I do some, uh, the ideas, how we be able to migrate on the PCB uh, platform. So that's why uh, before, so we, we, we do a lot of the geometrical dimensions of the three working electrodes. By right on the sensors for the electrochemical, we rely on the three work type of the electrode, the working electrode, the counter electrode and the reference and uh, reference electrode. So by using the existing PCB, how, how we uh, we do for the outsource jelly, we need to limit the size for four mil. So by understanding the render civic equation, so we see how the current, how the current is a uh, is a uh, proportional to the a is the surface area of the electrode. So I mean, by right, if we increase the surface area, so that you you can increasing the current, but it's not come to the purpose because you want to miniaturize the the system. So I mean, you have to miniaturize the size of the electrode, but you have to increase the current. So uh, with that. Uh, uh, the 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 relationship. So how we come out the possibilities of the working electrode uh, design, and then but we can compromise the the range of the current. How can reflect to our limit of the detection? So actually we 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 have because we rely on the standard printed circuit board that mean the fr4 on top fr4 they have a copper so but we have not that we have we we need to know so we any a uh, biosensors applications i mean for the detection the best materials as a goal right the second is a uh, platinum that mean in terms of the compatibilities and then uh, in terms of how, uh, how, uh, how we can easier to do the interact with the amine or all the, that mean for the 
uh, for uh, for uh, GO and then for the gold with a uh, tayo. So that that how we need to do the modifications on the current PCBs and then how uh, how we have uh, do the uh, coating. I mean do the the coating with uh, the gold electrode. So Chelis, uh, we have come a few design from the IDE design. So that the first uh, design with uh, my P, uh, PhD student, the, how we come the IDE. So from the IDE, actually we, we done a lot of a study on the piece between the, the electrode in the electrode because uh, that can relate to your ohmic resistance. So how can it affect the noise of the sensors? And then that the final, Finally, the final design that that we we be our final uh, platform. So how we uh, study need uh, the ratios between the counter electrode and the working electrode is more than five. So that to reduce the effect of the uh, 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 corrosion. So with that, so that how we 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 do the development. Uh, of course, uh, we do the. Uh, we we identify so how we work with our partners uh, in USM with the Inform, uh, the one of the high COE in uh, uh, so uh, in the USM. So how their their group uh, uh, give uh, do the engineer on the on the on the app terms. So that how uh, how we do the. Uh, the the position. I mean, how uh, how how we can mobilize on our working electrode. So, mean uh, this. So how how to improve the uh, how to improve the uh, the 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 current. Actually, we we need to improve the surface areas of the electrode. So by to improve the surface area electrode. But without enlarge the working electrode, so we do the uh, the print, we do the depositions with the graphene oxide on top. I mean, with a carbon materials, how can improve the 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 area, the surface area? So here we we have the GO with that the graphene oxide, and then on top, and then we add with the tosan to improve the current signals. So with that, by having the uh, the GO, so that we improve the increment of the current signal for the sensors. Right. So, <coughs> uh, so with but the current technique, what what the limitations on our uh, uh, the sensors fabrication. So up to goal, I mean, up to that standard, we 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 can use any the conventional technique. So uh, in normal uh, printed circuit board, but we still have the uh, difficulties or the challenges. I mean, to find a very suitable ink. I mean, to 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 a uh, drop cast. I mean, to to dot. I mean, to to uh, attest on the working and uh, working electrode. So as now, I mean to prove the 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 functioning of the sense the functioning of the sensor actually we do the the drop casting the go on our working electrode but we by do the manual drop casting actually that we have the prob the problem the problem the the chain uh, the challenges in terms of the on the repeatabilities so by having so once the when we have the sensors uh, so that how we do the integration with the microfluidic so that how we do the micro channel the 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 final how we do the integrate the integration with the uh my, the uh, microcontrollers hopefully so that can be able to provide the data and then to the cloud so that i always talk to my student that we uh, we can name as a Internet of Salmonella thing. So this a project that what we do with the uh, inform uh, under the quest grant to develop uh, the ultra sensitive digitalized dig, uh, dig uh, Salmonella detection. So this years we have a 
biogenesis yes. actually we we apply the the current uh, uh, product by the uh, by the biologist named the aptasense but uh, we do the modifications on our external port that mean to to shoot our uh, the our output uh, electrode and then tap to the uh, portable readers uh, microcontrollers that developed by the biogenes so that how uh, how we be able to transmit the data in through the mo uh, mo mobile phone and then that we also can detect the uh, the on the localized i mean with the detection is happening so that the the what what the beauties of this uh, system actually by we can enlarge on the data analytic the cloud so that uh, that we can fast uh, identify with the resources of the outbreak so uh, so that how we do the uh, for for this uh, development actually we we have a two type of the uh, receptors uh, the first uh, we 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 using the dna uh, the salmonella uh, using the dna uh, uh, sensors so uh, so that what uh, what we can have a uh, so do the detection uh, up to the uh, the the concentration up to 0.01 uh, uh, micrometers. So that uh, uh, the so the one uh, the the so here's what what we do the we, we the from uh, from the EIS from uh, from the DPVs. So that we uh, we can see they can give a different of the current so without detection so that the the bare arm the goal is a without detection so one on uh, one they have the 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 detections so I mean they can uh, reduce the current why by by having the detection so that can be the uh, it uh, re, uh, reduce the ionic movement because they have a, the binder so that can the, reduce the current so from 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 the threshold of the current uh, values so we can identify either that the positive or the negative so that can be a good uh, the how we be able to convert from the quant from the uh, qualitative to to the quantitative uh, data in term of the current signals so the we we also the other type of the dna we we also are working on the on the using the aptamus as a detections so that how we we have a two type of the uh the the type of the 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 receptors and uh, the aptamus slye and then that how and also the white white and is so how we be able to detect up to the 1.132 uh, microcam per milliliters. Lah. So that how uh, the the current, uh, the development on the lab on printed circuit board for the salmonella. And then other than that, we also uh, working uh, we using the same uh, platform, but uh, we uh, the inform side, the engineer, the the DNA how can be selective to the COVID detections. So the the one of our output actually we we done a publish on the lab on a chip uh, this year's uh, volume twenty three and then on the lab on a chip uh, journals. So how we be able to uh, miniaturize the the uh, detections uh, using the 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 PCB technique, then then be able to uh, this even though the one mass, uh, one base uh, mismatch DNA sequencing. So, so uh, by using the technique of the rigid PCB, so that how we be able to do the integrations with the microfluidic and then by do the engineer of the uh, the receptors, so that how uh, uh, how we can apply for uh, salmonella and also for the COVID detections. So that is one of the, the, the video that done by my students. 
to how uh, how we can summarize the step by step on the customer the 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 lab on the board for a biosensor treatment. So that and uh, uh, the next, I just give some quick overview about our current uh, the, the the development part towards to the flexible and the stressable printed circuit board. So uh, actually, the the one of our motivation actually we want to how the possibility to have the system that what we call the smart bandits. So right right now uh, the the doctors. Just uh, give your give a person okay, please come to the next month. But they don't know what the objectively the in the the indicator the the condition of wound. So the best on the paper that uh, uh, published. So what the parameters to uh, to indicate the the wound condition. The one is the pH values. So so if the pH value, uh, so that how they have more alkalic. So it mean one more alkalic. So that how it can easier the bat, the bacteria to grow. So that is one indicators. The I like six point something. So that that is. So and then the second the oxygenations and also the temperatures. So uh, that how we how they consider as uh, the 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 help the the normal temperatures. So so by by detect the three uh, parameters, actually we be able to correlate how how the wound the condition, and if we be able to know the pH wound, actually how we can correlate if what the numbers of the uh, the bacteria, so that we can uh, propose what is the 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 right amount of the ant, uh, antibiotic to dispense 
to uh, look uh, the lo the the localized wound, so that can uh, can uh, reduce uh, the 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 problem of the prolonged wound, right? So with that uh, motivations, how be able to have a bandage with uh, the objectively uh, the data? So the one of our uh, project right now, how we be able to develop the PS sensors. So PS sensors, how it can attest on the bandage. So there's a paper that are uh, published by the dear Hyung Kim Jones. So how they are studies. Uh, so to make it the uh, system, the system must be the comfort, the comfortable to the patient, chalice, uh, and then then easier to stick on the uh, on the uh, skin. Actually, the one of the criteria, the thickness of the substrate. So here's some uh, data from uh, Dear Hyun Jong Kim. So published on the 2011. So if our thickness substrate is the 500 micrometer, actually it's not stick. It's not stick well on the skin. So come to the 100 micrometers and come to the, th the 36 micrometers and then how they see how the 5 micrometers mean it can stick nicely on the skin we don't need any the any the addition uh buffers uh, as like glue and something to to stick exactly on the on the skin so mean by by control the thickness of the subset so that be we be able to mean the naturally it be able to stick on the skin so mean from that paper so we see how the pos how the possibilities uh, to develop the circuit or the sensors on the very ultra thin film uh, subset so uh, that's why uh, we that that the how we motivations so uh, how like I mentioned just now so by having that a uh, system how we attach how we have a uh, 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 sensors, how we attach on the bandage so that can have the real time uh, 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 monitoring of for the patient. So on do that. So in in our lab, actually we 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 uh, under the uh, um, the uh, grant by uh, Miti, actually that we we have uh, the one the the simple uh, printer but not so advanced in uh, MIMOS so but we 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 be able to do some uh, uh, the printed the uh, the carbon based ink and then how to to print it on the the flexible uh, subset so how and uh, how we do that so the one we have the thin film the ultra thin film uh, subset so we need we need to attach first on the rigid stick on the rigid uh, PCB. The on uh, light here, uh, we stick on the FR4. And then after we done the printing, so we 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 remove the the film from uh, from the from the what we call the the carrier platform. So we need a, a carrier platform and then we have to stick and then to avoid any the problem of the air, right? So that to have to ensure the printing and attach uh, nicely on the PCB. I mean, on the on the sub uh, substrates. So that that how we have uh, some uh, with our partners uh, because we work with the our partners. Uh, uh, but I I cannot um, uh, mean the name the partners because they they are expert in the uh, polymers uh, the po, uh, the uh, 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 polymer de development so how uh, how uh, how we work with them uh, how they they provide us that what 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 I said to you this have uh, the 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 different thickness of the subset so that that the gitosan uh, 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 the that that we call as a CTS a film. So how the currently we are working on uh, do the 
uh, the as a preliminary studies to to state I mean to design the PS sensors, but we still using the electrochemical sensing technique to to do the PS detection. So the data here, I we we see so this picture is not reflect to the top pictures because this picture we see on the PET how the nicely uh, the the uh, the formation but the 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 one one we have the that's the the one of the thin film the not not yet ultra not not ultra yet but we have uh, but we can see how we still have the prob the probability of the wrinkle right so so that's why right now we still do the optimizations on the after we do the printing. So what is the best method to cure the uh, the the design? Because uh, we have a pro the second issue that we need to consider. So the first uh, to avoid the wrinkle of the subset must have a fast cure. All must have a cure at a low time, right? So it comes to how the viscosity of your ink. So if your ink is uh, is too light, so need a longer time to do the cure. I mean to to for uh, any need need the high temperature. So we we still on working with them. So they are working on the formulations of the subset. The so we are working on the optimizations of the of that recipe. Uh, that how we can do the so actually that what we have the preliminary data in terms of the CV measurement we see they give a uh, very unity values that mean from anodic and the cathodic so uh, mean it right now so we we without uh, without if we ignore by ignoring the the wrinkle uh, uh, Problem, actually, they still give the unities between the anodic and cathodic. From that data, we see are uh, they be able, they give, uh, they be able to working as an electrochemical sensors, but we still need to a lot optimizations on the problem uh, with the winker. And then now we are still going down to uh, what the best, what the film, the most ultra. Uh, thickness lah. I mean, towards to the applications for the. So what the idea is? So we we have a PS that then this film we we attach directly on the bandage lah. That 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 for the uh, uh, wound monitoring. So that what the the data that we have the correlation between the PS and the voltage. But uh, the LOD is still uh, lower compared to the best mark so that we need a lot of the formulations of the in that's why in terms of the pcb we have a standard pcb but we still have the limitations on the to on on the printed the the sensing membrane we 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 that's why if you see the video just now actually for the geo we do the drop casting right so that's how we did the I mean we need to have we don't have a full a standard i mean from the subsets up to the sensing membrane in a printable electronics and then like just i mentioned by the site just now uh we also uh uh we must have a good ink so that what what we did with my student and then we see how they good the properties in so that how the doctor site uh, just uh, present how we did with a uh, mimos we we provide the design and then that we can see uh, right now we are working on the antenna on the PET but the the circuit still on the uh, uh, polymide and then and then we see how that coil that be able to harvest and then they can uh, uh, transmit the data to the handphone mean the design have uh, the ink that provided by MIMO stream so have a sufficient the conductivities to 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 flow the current and then be able to harvest to power up the sensor so that's some some uh, video of uh, how we did in my lab so after we receive 
so that we we can see so we so the the antenna that we are uh, fabricated by the MIMOS actually we can see how it be able to transmit the data and then give the value of the temperature sensors here's on that uh, circuit we attach with the temperature uh, sensors and then one uh, uh, the one we put at at the 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 hot side and then we can see how the temperature we increasing so mean they 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 give the 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 hot lah. so and then so we can so they they not only um power up the sensor but also can uh, transmit the data to the nfc and then they up so one i want one my student uh, 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 replaced i mean to change to the call side and then they see how the uh, temperature is dropped so that how we did but with uh, the antenna on pet but the circle on polymer right now we are working on the fully integrations so the antenna and also the circuit on a same subset so that how we did the one of the project what we did with a uh, mimos so and then the others uh, we also ongoing on the strain sensors uh, that what we work with a uh, school of materials a uh, prof maratis their team they are expert in the ink uh, the the polymer the stressable ink so that means how uh, how they do the ink formulation between the between, between ms to have a stressable with uh, the the different percentage of uh, silver nanowires and then how to improve how to make it the polymer conductive ink right so that how uh, in uh, the school material labs so in uh, the school of uh, materials and in every resource engineering so we can see how to test the stressable how 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 uh, how does how the stability of the ink and if we increasing that mean how they still have the conductivity to light up the LED so and then the second issue uh so when we when we want migrate from the rigid pcb so that the rigid pcb to the sensible pcb so we we still don't have any the comprehensive uh, standard in terms of the how much the curve the curving how much the curving for uh, for uh, for uh, for the pad because the stressable we we need consider the curving compared to the rigid because the one you stress so if you still maintain as a sub edge so that can easier to break out your circuit trace so that can be not that can affect the disconnection lah between the, the uh, on the circuit so that is one of the issue need to come out how how we think how we can come out the standard uh the design rules for the stressable uh pcb uh, design so that what we have a uh, few uh, subset so that the on gel gelatin that on the pva and that on the polymide and so on so the challenge right now on the lab on pcbs uh actually uh we 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 don't have a full capacity i mean the full uh, standard fabrication from the electrode up to the microfluidic so mean a uh, certain part we we can complete using the pcb but such as how to to do the integrations with the microfluidic we need the another process such as like the glass pcb bonding or the anodic bonding to integrate with the microfluidic and then in term of the lab on pcbs we have the design rule but purely for the circuit that mean to do the circuit design but not any the design rule up to the up to the microfluidic or that mean up to for a biosensors application so and then for the comprehensive uh, right now for the stressable pcb and for the for the gable file we we have a standard for the rigid uh, pcb but we still don't have a standard yet if we want to design the stressable uh that mean for towards to the flexible hybrid printed circuit board and and also like like i mentioned you now for my uh, video we still the the 
the limitations of the sensing membrane in the inform. That's why we hope MIMOS, with their expertise, they can also explore any of the potential ink, so that can be directly can be printing on our electrode, so it can be used uh, as a sensing membrane for a biosensors application. So as summarized, so actually we we proved some implementation of the lab on PCB. Uh, for the uh, salmonella and also for the PA sensors and also for the COVID and also we see some implementation of our flexible printed circuit board and how we do the integration with the microfluidic and also we by having the collaborations between the academia and industries so that can be more can can faster up to the move up the technologies uh, advance of the advancement in the technology for the local development. So that I the announcement for my PhD student and also the collaborators. Of course that my my team uh, we have a uh, Dr. Yasmin from uh, by uh, the that uh, by from the school of biological and then we have Dr. Hyrule from the sign from the chemistry. So how he helped us in terms of the EIS and then on the electrochemical part. And then of course we have uh, our partner from for the biomedical part, we we have the inform uh, Prof. Azia, and then from the Paul Limers, we work with the Prof. Mariti from School of Materials, and from the antenna, we, we work with the Prof. CD group from the UITM, and of course, our partners uh, from Dr. Lee Hiwa group and, 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 and Dr. Said, they, they how they help us in terms of the in development from the MIMOS, and also with uh, Sibin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Astro. Is there uh, any questions? Let me check the chat box. Okay, there's a question here. Okay. Are uh, conductivity importance for SPE? Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, the how the conductivity is uh, depend on what type of the device that you want to develop, right? So, for example, if you want to develop for uh, for the antenna, we we need the highly conductive lah, right? So, but from from our case, like we want to uh, developed for the biosensors uh, uh, applications, right? So like like a geo, like um, the 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 RGO. So conductivity is not we we don't need the higher conductivity, but we need a good model uh, fastener group to be attached with our receptors, lah. Mm. So that depend on the application that you want to develop the the and uh, the census lah. Mm. okay is there any other questions but um but if uh, if you want to develop uh to the circuit that mean to apply as a uh, as a circuit trace so actually we are best mark with our copper circuit trace lah, right so because for for for, for example like if you have the mcu here actually we the our trace at least six can flow 16 milliamp to power up the the MCUs. So that that mean if the circuit trace, we need also the conductivity. I mean to ensure they can flow the carbon to power up the system mm. And then the second, of of course, uh, if you have a higher carbon, so they uh, they also have the, uh, and then the so uh, as a full system we. We also need to consider the the power consumption. So that that I mean the the voltage, the current, that how we can relate to the conduct uh, activities lah. Okay. Uh, looks like there, if there's questions, you go right to the end of this session to take more yeah. more questions. So thank you, uh, Dr. Azrul, for your in depth. Uh, uh, sharing on what uh, you guys are doing in 
your university. It's good to see that uh, you'll share this information with your students as well. And we are really excited about some of your uh, research work. OK, thank you, Dr. Azrul. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our final speaker for today's webinar is Mr. Tang Kok Un. He is the co-founder and CEO of Biogenes Technologies, a Malaysian-based company. Mr. Tang has more than 15 years of experience in bringing technologies from R&D stage to commercialized market. Mr. Tang majors in chemical engineering and MBA from University of Malaya as well as having graduated from Stanford University Center of Professional Development in Entrepreneurship. So with that short introduction, I hand this over to Mr. Tang. Over to you, sir. You have to unmute, sir. Can you unmute? OK, can you okay, hear me? OK, great. OK, I can hear you. All right, all right, thank you. So I hope everybody can see the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir, yes. we can uh, see the screen. OK, we can see your screen. OK, OK. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, and thank you for to Mimos for inviting uh, me for this uh, webinar. And after hearing the previous two speakers, now I'm starting to see the context of my presentation. So I'm going to try to put it within that context to, you know, so we, we can see there's a continuity in, in the this webinar, all right? So um, on my side, we are talking about um, digital biotechnology, and later I will explain to you how this relates to uh, the previous speakers. Uh, my name is Tang, I'm the CEO of Biogenes Technologies. Uh, so I, I'll be going a bit about what Biogenes do, um, what is our technology platforms. Uh, the keyword is uh, digital biotechnology. And we have three platform uh, we call AppCat, AppCat and AppSense. Uh, essentially it's about uh, AppTamer computer aided design, AppTamer fabrication and AppTamer sensing. And um, we also want to show some projects that we have done with our current collaborators, mainly universities and research institutions, which we started since 2018. Uh, so every time we do a collaboration, that is like a cycle. So um, the, those collaboration that were starting in 2018 is now uh, bearing fruits in terms of uh, uh, undergoing trials and uh, going into commercial, uh, we expect by next year. So uh, firstly about us, um, but let, let me put in the context of uh, our, our work with uh, the previous speakers. I think uh, just now um, uh, Mimos talked about uh, flexible electronics for health application. Uh, there are more and more of these. I think every one of us or most of us uh, now wear a smartwatch, which comes with uh, some sensor to detect our, for example, our heartbeat and, and so on. And this kind of variables will become more and more advanced. Uh, there are a lot of development in this area, which also why um, you know MIMOS and many research institutions are doing on this. But on our side, we are especially looking into this area called biosensor, which you can see in the red circle on the on the left hand side. Um, now, when you talk about variables biosensor, essentially they are uh, roughly their three classification. Uh, one which is already in the market uh, in the form of continuous glucose monitor, uh, where you have a patch on your on your skin, usually on your arm and uh, it sends signal into an app and it tracks your glucose uh, level throughout the day uh, and it can last for two days uh, you know, for tracking. And uh, this works by uh, having this thing called uh, micro needles that goes into the skin. And under the skin, we have this uh, layer of fluid called institutional fluid. So instead of blood, it actually detects uh, this institutional fluid. Basically, it's, it's uh, a, a fluid in your skin cell. And from there, it can detect uh, a glucose sensor, uh, the glucose level. But of course, there's a lot of um, calibration, alignment, optimization to make it uh, uh, perform comparable with the glucose sensor that we use, you know, the, the glucose strips. So that, that is the value of the technology that's been developed. 
uh, currently are two major players in the market. One is Abbott, one is a company called Dexcom. Uh, for some of you who uh, go through the Penang Bridge, second bridge, you will actually see Dexcom uh, manufacturing facility being uh, set up there. So Malaysia is in that game, uh, of course, with uh, foreign investment. Uh, the other one, we have a uh, sweat metabolite sensor. Uh, essentially, this is a biosensor strip that you put onto your skin, and it measures various metabolites, uh, lactate and uh, potassium, pH, and so on. And that tells you also about the condition of your body. Uh, so it can be used in a professional manner, for example, in sports, uh, professional sports, to measure your body condition, skin temperature, and it can also be, probably in the future, it can also be as conventional to be used in uh, normal exercise, you know, just to make sure that we, we don't stress our body too much. Uh, the other one is what we call focal optic sensor. Uh, the most common is uh, like your Apple Watch. So if you turn it around, you will see there are two green lights there. And it uses a principle called uh, PPG, or uh, the longer word is photoplastimography. Okay, uh, so this essentially measures the, the the wave peaks of your uh, blood vessel, and it gives you feedback. And with some calibration and optimization, it can tell you a lot of a uh, 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 certain level of of, of metabolites in your body. Right. So these are the basic uh, three technology. Um, for us, uh, we work mostly on this synthetic antibodies called Aptamer, uh, which was previously mentioned uh, by Dr. Azronizam. And um, we developed the Aptamers and also the testing solutions for human healthcare, diseases in animals, aquaculture, and agriculture. Uh, it can range as simple as um, dropping the sample onto the sensor, plugging into our device, and it will communicate with our uh, uh, app to transmit the signal. Uh, but the same thing, it can also be integrated into a variable sensor. It can also be used in other uh, different uh, sensing platforms, uh, for example, ELISA, uh, histochemistry, and so, which we are working with uh, various institutions, uh, including Inform and Hospital USM. Okay. So essentially, we are building that bioreceptor that can be integrated with uh, different sensing devices. Uh, a bit about biogenes and what we have achieved so far, um, we are proud to say that um, all our technology is 100% locally. And how do we manage to do that is by working with all the experts in the research institution and universities. Uh, personally, I have been working with uh, researchers since 2008 uh, we learn a lot in the process, you know, what works, what doesn't work, uh, because bear in mind that not all research can be uh, commercialized. Uh, in 2015, when Biogen started, we also worked actively uh, with research, uh, even until today. And we are also looking for the next cycle of uh, research innovation that we want to work with, right? Uh, so currently, I think we work with about at least 13 different research teams. Uh, from both private and local universities. Um, and um, we are able to uh, raise up to 30 million so far from uh, various grants uh, by the Malaysian government. Uh, Malaysian government is very supportive of R&D commercialization. And also we got a Series A investment from private venture capital. So uh, in fact, this month, we are moving to our new lab facility uh, within UPM. So hopefully we can invite some of you to come over and you know pay with it, and we can discuss with our team on different uh, opportunities. All right, and uh, we also are proud to say that um, we are first in the world to actually bring a timer from uh, biocomputational design all the way now to field testing and trials in hospitals. We have two ongoing trials. One is in hospital UKM. Once it is in Hospital Pengaja UPM, and we have the upcoming in Hospital USM. So we essentially develop everything from A to Z. And, and it's, it's a necessity for us because one of the challenges to do commercialization in Malaysia is that uh, we don't have the value chain uh, you know, from this industry to that industry. And a lot of industry we talk to are really not interested to invest in technology. Uh, so we decided that we need to go from A to Z, 
uh, in fact, we are going to manufacturing now, which I will describe uh, later. Uh, okay, regarding our technology, um, so let's look at uh, uh, the Aptamer, and I'll try to explain uh, what is Aptamer in case some of you may, may not be familiar with it. Uh, okay, this, this test kit, I think everybody knows, the RTK for COVID. Uh, and now, it, if you are unfortunately COVID positive, you will see there's this double line. And this double line, uh, how does it detect your, your, your COVID infection is that it, on the paper, which is underneath, there is actually a, a coating of antibody which is the green color Y shape uh, molecule. And if you have COVID, where you have your COVID antigen, uh, it will actually stick onto the antibody because the antibody has been designed to recognize the antigen. Now, if you have other virus, for example, you have flu or, or others, it will not stick onto the antibody. So if you are negative, let's say you have flu and you are negative, it doesn't stick. But if you have a fever and you are, COVID positive, it will tell you that this double line will tell you that you are, you are infected by this very special uh, ingredient called antibody. Now, to produce antibody traditionally or even now, uh, you actually use this animal. So either you inject the COVID antigen into the animal, uh, you know, just like how we get vaccine. Once the antigen is injected into us, we will react towards it. Our body will see it as a foreign matter, it will react. So to produce this kind of antibody, you actually inject into a, a, a mouse and the mouse inside the cell will react to it. And you harvest the cell and you use it to produce more antibody. This is the, the, the new technique. Well, unfortunately, the, this kind of method uh, requires the use of animals and you have to kill the animal. So um, we believe that it's a better method by using a uh, computational design rather than using uh, animals in a biological lab. Of course, there are many, many other uh, benefits. It's cheaper, faster, and also it's more accurate. So the green uh, antibody that you see here, uh, essentially it targets the molecule, but if you look at it from the entire uh, uh, antibody shape, it's actually shaped like a Y. So it has two, uh, like a two head or we call epitope to capture the target molecule. But for us, we are using aptamers, uh, the one that you see on the red color, that is very similar to the antibody. It also binds itself to the molecular target, right? So as you can see, the aptamer is also much smaller and it can penetrate much better into the target molecule. So you, how, how, how do we make the aptamers? So the aptamers essentially are not derived from biological animals. Uh, we are actually using a very, very simple process. We just construct the RNA or DNA. And when we construct the RNA and DNA in a certain shape, it will actually fold into a three-dimensional shape uh, that you see on the, on the upper right hand. So that shape fits into the target molecule. So this is how it works. And it's very, very simple. It's a chemical process. It's not even a biological process. So there's, uh, so atomers are basically bioreceptors and it's constructed from RNA or DNA. Uh, it can bind to proteins, hormones, antibiotics, metabolites. Uh, in fact, it can even bind to uh, metal ions. So you can see on the right-hand side, you can have an atomer, which is the red color, and a protein, which is much bigger. Now, on the reverse, you can have an aptamer, the one that you see on the, uh, the white color, is much bigger and a pesticide molecule actually sits on, onto it. So it works both ways, whether for small molecule or big molecule. And it works like a, a, a key to a lock. So it only fits that molecule and not other molecule. Um, the benefit of aptamer is uh, you can synthesize on the spot. We already have our aptamer synthesizer, which I can show later. Uh, there's no batch variation. Every time you follow the same sequence, you will get the same folding, you get the same behavior. Uh, it is very, very stable thermally. Uh, for example, in our lab, we keep our aptamers in dry form, just you know, just in the in the lab without any need for refrigeration. And even if you reconstitute with buffer, you just need to keep it at four degrees Celsius uh, because everyone knows DNA is very, very stable. 
uh, and we don't need to use any animals, uh, none at all. So whether in the research or development or production stage, we don't need. Um, and it also works on uh, to produce a panel for toxin and what we call non-immunogenic immu compound. The reason is that when you want to produce an antibody for a toxin, once you inject into an animal, the animal will die because it's a toxin. So you cannot get your antibody. But for epimers, we can produce epimers for, for toxin just by using a computational process. So this is a very distinct advantage. So we have the approach to develop epimers for snake venom, for example, or even other venoms in the future. Um, and because the chemistry is so simple, we can just pack it with a functional group like biotin, HRP, amine, carboxyl, chio, because it's just a very basic chemis chemistry to pack it. So that makes everything so simple. Okay, And um, there have been a lot of publication on the use of Aptamer for therapeutics and also for diagnostics. Um, so in our case, uh, in one hand, we have been developing a lot of uh, uses of Aptamer in various uh, diagnostic platforms. Uh, from what we call ELASA, Western blot, histochemistry, and most important, or, or biosensor, which is the, the most important topic that we are discussing today. Uh, beyond that, we are also working with some uh, research uh, institutions to develop for cancer therapeutics. Essentially, when the epithelial can bind to a certain location on the cell or on the protein, we can also use that to inhibit the function of the protein or we can use it to attract, uh, uh, for example, in this case, we use it to attract what we call a natural killer cell, which is uh, one of the uh, immune cells in our body towards uh, the target cell, which is a cancerous cell. So by putting a aptamer that can attract both cells together, we are pulling the immune cell towards the cancer cell so that the immune cell can kill the cancer cell much easier in our body. So. This is something very exciting for us, and uh, this will be in our next cycle of development. Uh, in terms of how we digitize our technology, uh, we have three platforms in, 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 in the process. Uh, one we call the AppCAD, which is actually uh, what we call AppTamer Computer Aided Design. Uh, so we use that to design our AppTamer using computers. We have a AppFab or AppTamer fabrication, which is essentially a desktop. Uh, kind of device uh, that we can uh, use it to synthesize aptamer on the spot. Within two to three hours, we can get our aptamer. And we have our aptamer sensing platform, or we call AppSense, that uh, we can put different kind of uh, aptamer onto different sensor chips, uh, and it goes into our reader, and uh, we can use it to test different, different uh, diseases. So for example, today I can use it to test for COVID. Tomorrow I can use it to test for, uh, for example, PSA or prostate specific antigen in, in my blood. So imagine you can have a home uh, device that you can test you or your family or your, your grandparents or your parents just by a single device. That will be uh, really a groundbreaking vision that we are trying to achieve. And bringing it beyond that, from our home to the entire world. Um, now, because the design of the aptamer is done using computer, and we are, we are going to put it online soon uh, by end of the year, someone in Malaysia can actually design the aptamer, uh, and after that, he or she can just upload that information into a central database to the internet. And someone in India or China or Africa or Europe can just download that information and if that person has a synthesizer, uh, a thermal synthesizer, he and she can synthesize on the spot and immediately you can use it. So you don't have to uh, send your, your aptamers or antibody across borders. As you know, now sending things across borders can be quite difficult. So you just send the information, you know, just like how in the past we used to post letters you know, to our colleagues or our counterpart in US. Now it's just a email away, it's all digitalized. So this is the digital technology of biotechnology that we are talking about. And uh, this is our vision that it can go to the entire world. And uh, people can just go to the website, uh, 
look for the right attema for all kinds of disease and just download it and synthesize it. Okay. Uh, now let, let, let me dive deeper into the different uh, technology platform that we have. First of all, of course, is AppCAD. So AppCAD is a software, a series of software that we designed, uh, you know, created to design AppTamers virtually. And uh, it allows us to have our AppTamers quite fast, ranging from two to eight weeks, compared with the conventional uh, uh, wet lab method, uh, which might take up to eight weeks or even half a year or even more, right? So the only limitation now we are facing is the computer speed. And we are now using cloud services. We are using high-speed computer to run the simulation. And uh, the, the timeline has been shortened every, every, every year. Um, and if you can see on the bottom right, the, the color box, this software allows us to target where we want to bind onto it. Unlike the wet lab method, which is random, here we can uh, say, I want to target on that portion of the target protein. I want to target on this portion. And if I, I want it for inhibition, inhibition, I can use here. So this allows the, the designer to have a lot of flexibility where the person wants to target. Because as you know, protein can have different functions. It can be what we call uh, across the cell membrane. So we need to choose the right location where you want it to be, uh, to have a specific function, all right? So um, by uh, end of the year, we are actually now we are going to launch the beta version, uh, uh, doing the beta testing. And by end of the year, uh, earliest, we will actually launch the tool. And then of course, we will invite researchers to come and use it to design app timers for their own. So uh, it's all done uh, in the, in, 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 on the website. You don't even need a high-speed computer or download any software to do it. So this is an example of our software interface. So uh, it's going to be on subscription. So you just register like how you register for your Gmail and uh, you're, you're, immediately you're, you're free to use. Of course, on our side, we also organize training sessions for people to learn uh, uh, from uh, basic level to intermediate to, to expert level. Uh, so this will be an ongoing process for us with, uh, you know, starting with Malaysia, of course, and then hopefully we can reach out to the rest of the world. Um, let me give you an analogy between um, uh, AppCAD and how it can advance our, our AppTamer design or uh, for medical use and various, various diagnostic use. Uh, imagine um, 50 years ago or more, if we want to build a fall building, we will need to build a physical model. We will need to put it on the earthquake uh, table. We will need to put it in a wind tunnel. Uh, and all kinds of uh, physical simulation to ensure that we get a good design. If we get the design wrong, we have to rebuild the whole model again and again until we get it right. Okay, But now, we have engineering software. You just go to the software, you can design buildings. So as you know, now high-rise buildings are booming because partly it's because of this engineering software which makes the process so easy. So on that analogy, um, now we are using biotech lab, you know, wet lab, a uh, lot of wastage, a lot of man hours, uh, and a lot of things to dispose, the chemicals to dispose, the biological agents to dispose, and, and it's expensive to set up a biotech lab. But now everything can be compressed onto a software, at least for our ephemeral design. So, but it's kind of strange that how we got into this is because when we first started back in 2017, 2018, uh, the reason that time we don't have enough funding, so we decided not to go to the lab route. So we decided to explore the software route. And uh, sure enough, uh, until today, we are still uh, doing it. But I'm not saying that we don't need the wet lab at all. We still need the wet lab at the final stage of validation. But we have reduced that process a lot. So that is the advantage. These are some of the attempts that we have designed uh, over the years, uh, ranging from small molecules to big molecules. Right? Um, the next one is our attempt fabrication uh, or app fab. So this is essentially a device that sits on your desktop like a laser printer. Uh, it's got only about 20 kg, not, not, not very heavy. 
And uh, we call it like espresso machine, you know, like you want to make coffee instead of going through the complicated process, you just use a quick espresso machine and you got your coffee. So within two to three hours, you can get your attempt immediately. And if you remember this sound, you can just download that information from uh, the attempt sequence from a website. Okay. Uh, and this, this device uses a, a combination of microfluidic technology and plug-in cartridges. So again, it works like a printer. If your consumable has run out, you just plug in your cartridges at the bottom, as you can see at the at the right draw uh, picture there, and you are, you are done. You can produce the next batch again and again and again. Uh, but however, this just to let everybody know, this device is uh, not designed by us. It we work with our uh, principal, which is based in Europe, to to. Uh, uh, sort of like customize it for Aptamer use. And uh, finally, it's our sensing platform. Uh, this is very interesting because it's uh, connected to the earlier uh, uh, speakers. So uh, glucose technology has been around since the 80s. I'm sure every one of you, every one of us has used such a device before in our lifetime. Um, but you look at the significant, like, instead of going to hospital now, you can actually do it at home. Uh, even some pharmacies are offering it as a free service just to attract customers to go into their, their shop. So this has become a, a, this is a very portable device. And imagine if the same technology, which is electrochemical assay, can be expanded to all kinds of testing that we might possibly want to do at home. Uh, you know, ranging from food safety to our uh, markers, uh, inflammatory markers, and, and so. Um, and our, our device is actually developed. Uh, for example, just now, uh, I'm happy to, to see that CDEC is using our device. Uh, it sends a Bluetooth signal into your mobile app, uh, which is already available on Android uh, Google Play Store. And once it reads the reading, it will send the reading, whatever you are measuring, it will send your time where the reading is taken, it will send the GPS location where this is taken into a central database. And you can actually track, you know, like, like remember in the, in during the COVID pandemic, if you, it's really important to track who is infected and who is not infected. So because that, that kind of information can also be further crunched, analyzed to see how diseases spread whether it's in human, animals, plants, or anything. So that kind of feature gen generates a lot of information that can be used further downstream to predict disease spreading and, and so on, all right? So we already got the server running. Uh, and it is our vision to use this kind of portable diagnostic for from medical healthcare to agriculture, aqua, pollution, food safety, animal health. And we already have a few projects in different areas, which I will show you. And last Saturday, I was just uh, in uh, UCSI, and uh, they had been interest to work with some of the researchers there to go into aquaculture, aquatic science, and so on, to monitor you know, pollution in water and, and, and the rest. Uh, but taking beyond that, uh, if you look at the, the top left, it's something that we have developed, but Currently, it's just a circuit, circuit board, a very tiny circuit board, uh, about the size of a 50 cent coin, uh, but it's as compact as you get. So we can actually translate that into variables. Uh, you just put in a sensor, flexible sensor, which what Nemos is doing. We can put it onto a, you know, a, a patch like the one you see in the glucose, and the whole thing will become a variable sensor that you can wear. Um, to track your, 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 your metabolites. For example, in hospital, you can track your infection. When you go for marathon, you can track your certain markers so that you know when to stop. Uh, because as you know, there have been some people who, who got heart attack during all these kind of uh, strenuous exercise. So it, it saves lives if you, if you know how to use it at the right, right time. Okay, uh, so some projects that we are doing, um, we have supplied the devices and the uh, sensor to Mardi, where they actually go to the sea to detect uh, toxic algae bloom. 
So that's where the crowd uh, function helps. Because as soon as they uh, test it, the data goes straight to the cloud and their colleagues in uh, Madi HQ in Sedang can actually read, look at the reading straight away. And they can also know where is the location of the reading being done. Uh, there's also another project for Madi, uh, also with Madi for uh, paddy bacteria infection. So uh, according to Madi, if a paddy field is infected with a certain bacteria, it can wipe out 50% uh, of the production. So it's important as part of uh, Malaysia food security. So they go to the field, they take the leaf sample, and they uh, do some extraction, and they can actually do the detection on the spot. Uh, we also have a project on animal health uh, to detect foot and mouth disease in cattle. Uh, so you just need to go to the field, take the sample from the saliva of the animal, and then you just run on the spot as, again with GPS location provided. Uh, in human, uh, we are doing a bit more project, especially after COVID. Uh, everybody seems to be more focused on healthcare. So it was a good opportunity for us. Uh, we have a project with uh, Hospital Fengaga UPM, which I mentioned just now, uh, on Streptococcus B. So Strep B infection is very dangerous for pregnant women uh, because if they have infection on their skin and they, when they give birth, uh, the bacteria can be transmitted to the infant. And since the infant do not have immune system for the first few weeks, you can actually uh, you know, be, uh, kill the infant. So in US, uh, it is a mandatory test. In Malaysia, it's not yet, but we hope to work with uh, the hospital on this one. Currently, the method is taking a petri dish, you know, a bacterial culture, and it takes about two to four days. So hours, 30 minutes, you can get the reading out. So you can test the pregnant women on the spot, and if there is an indication of uh, infection, you can actually stand for a uh, confirmatory test or even prescribe antibiotic on the spot. Because once the mother go back, you know, like two days, you go back, come back, they, most, most, most often they don't want to come back anymore. Uh, the other one is sepsis. Um, we are working with Hospital UKN to, again, do a point of care test kit. 30 minutes, you take the blood sample, just like how you take glucose and you immediately you can know whether the person has sepsis or not. Uh, this is very important in uh, a &E or Accident and Emergency Department because uh, about one to four, one out of four patients in a &E actually die from sepsis, bacterial infection, not from the injury itself. So uh, Dr. Tan here, which is our collaborator, sees the importance of that and he has identified the biomarker and he's now working with us to bring that into trials. Now, imagine you, you can turn this, move further into a variable patch. That patients come in, you can actually get the patient to wear the patch for a couple of days to make sure that the sepsis would not happen or would not become serious. So that's where it can translate into a, another level of innovation by using variables. Uh, we have a project here with uh, UCSI, uh, with Prof. Shamala on uh, Dengue, Zika, and JE. Um, she says that uh, it is important as to differentiate between whether a person has been infected with Dengue, Zika, or JE, because now the symptoms are very similar. If you can differentiate it, then you know how to treat the, the, the patient. Uh, if not, if you mis misdiagnose, it can be very dangerous to give the wrong uh, prescription to, to the wrong disease. Okay, So this is her area of work, that we, but we are building the sensor for, for her. Uh, also, HPV, um, currently uh, the best method to, the only method to do HPV screening is through pap smear. Uh, it's a very invasive and uh, a very uncomfortable method, and also you need experts to do that. So we are trying to uh, develop a way you can just test for HPV infection using urine. So it can be used even in the community clinic, clinic data. So you just need to take a urine sample and you can test for HPV. 
screen for screening. If there is a possibility of the virus, you only go for the more invasive. You know, just like how in for COVID we do RTK, then only we do PCR to confirm. So this is very important, especially for women health, because HPV infection will lead to cervical cancer in a few decades down the road. So it's a problem if we don't solve now, it will come back to us in 30, 40 years. Uh, we also have a project with a private company in uh, to monitor antibiotic. So this is actually a patch on the on the on the arm, and it it measures the level of antibiotics in the blood during uh, administration, so that you don't overdose or underdose, because overdosing can be bad for the uh, human. For the patient and under those will will also be bad because the bacteria will not be be wiped out. So uh, this is a private uh, collaboration. So but the company is from overseas. So when we talk about the synthetic actimer, our entire platform, we start with the design of the actimer. Uh, we combine it to a target. Uh, you know, bind it to the target, whether it's a protein, antigen, antibody, and so on. And one of our unique technology is we design this using computational software. Then we can synthesize it on the spot using our FX platform. And then we put it onto our sensor sheet. Uh, and then we can turn it into a portable test kit. So the entire route, we already have developed it. And because we can internalize it, if any researcher or any company comes and say, I want to have something, you know, from a ephemeral toward to, to the sensing, we can actually do it within six month period. Now, when you talk about R&D for commercial, speed is very, very important. Because um, I think one of the shortcomings uh, when we talk about R&D commercialization in Malaysia is um, academic research, takes long time. But for commercial, we don't we can't afford to have that kind of uh, uh, time leisure of time. So we need to come up with the things very, very fast. So six months. But uh, having said that, um, a lot of our fundamental technology and know how expertise were built from the uh, ex, uh, you know from the R and D academic R and D that started I think more than twenty years ago. In fact just for everybody knowledge uh, the first biosensor group was started back in year 2000. Uh, that time they got a small grant from the MOSTI and from then on, you know, we have different generations of biosensor researchers. So that's how the difference between uh, academic research and commercial research. So our approach is to work a lot with academia, all right? Uh, you have the expertise, you have the equipment, uh, you know, that we can't afford as a private company. And we bring it from the idea to commercial. Uh, and of course, the TRL uh, one towards nine. Okay, so most of our uh, technology product now is actually in TRL eight to nine, which we are ready to launch. Um, we also provide seed grants to researchers. Uh, just this year, we, we selected seven. So uh, they are getting about 10,000 in uh, cash and also uh, about 20,000 in, in kind of uh, training, consumables and so on. The reason we want to come up with this grant is that we noticed that a lot of researchers, while they have good ideas, uh, because they don't have proof of concept, they don't have preliminary data, uh, when they submit to uh, you know the grant application panel, sometimes they get rejected because of that. But those are good ideas and we want to nurture that good ideas and give them a bit of grant so they can come up with some basic result, preliminary data to further to get more grants from MOPI or from MOSPI. Uh, we also sponsor uh, some of the researchers to oversee. For example, uh, we sponsor one researcher from USIM, uh, University of Science in South Malaysia. Uh, she has an attachment in UK. Uh, we also sponsor one of the researchers to present her paper on ephemeral HPV in Oxford in UK. These are just this year, all right? So again, we want to nurture the talent, uh, which is just as important as the technology. Uh, 
In terms of Biogen's future direction, uh, we are moving into large-scale manufacturing. Uh, so we are very eager to work with uh, organizations like, like MIMOS, who have developed the prototype and we want to go into large-scale manufacturing. Uh, we are looking into multi-array sensor. Uh, we have some, uh, as you can see in the picture here, but it's still very big uh, because of the limitation of our printing method, string printing method. So we hope to miniaturize it further that it can fit into our scheme patch also. Uh, of course, we are also uh, looking into variable sensors. Uh, we have some um, uh, collaborators who are interested, uh, but nothing concrete at the moment. So yeah, feel free to reach out to us or to me if you have any uh, you know common area of interest with, with us. So uh, last but not least, um, there's two QR code there. Uh, if you want to scan for look at our website, uh, and also you, if you want to give us an online inquiry, uh, that one at the bottom. Uh, but we always finish our slide with this tagline that uh, we only heard the mouse that is used to design the attempt on the computer. All right? So we don't hurt a live mouse, nor a rabbit, nor any animals, uh, because we just want to uh, make sure that whatever we do will have a ethical component because that, that is also being developed in, 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 in Europe and also in US. And the last thing we need is 10 years down the road, they come back and say that we cannot do this or we don't accept this because you are using animals. All right, just like how our palm oil uh, industry face all kinds of challenges. So, yeah. So thank you for the, uh, webinar opportunity and uh, feel free to ask any questions now or even later as we 